In America, historically, we've believed that self-reliance and hard work are virtues that every American citizen should have. We've believed that that was the way to achieve the American dream. It's the American work ethic, and it's the key to the opportunity and freedom that we that, uh, to achieve whatever God has uh, enabled us to achieve. We have the ability to reach for the stars in this country because brave men and women have died in order that we might have these freedoms. And then the basis, though, beyond that, of course, is that Jesus Christ has died in order that we might have the freedom to be all that God created us to be. Part of the struggle in our society right now is the struggle between those who understand that America has become the most prosperous nation on earth by teaching our people to work for a living rather than to depend on the government for some type of handout. The Amer American work ethic is great. I believe in it, and it's the only path that will provide a stable and prosperous future for our country economically. The only problem with the American work ethic is if we come to believe that that's the way that God relates to us spiritually. God doesn't operate on the American work ethic, as wonderful as it is. Why doesn't God operate based on the American work, eth work ethic or any work eth ethic? Because you and I could never work hard enough or never be good enough to get into heaven. Because, of course, the standard for getting into heaven is being perfect. Heaven's a perfect place. If you, weren't, if you went into heaven and you took your sin with you into heaven and your imperfections, heaven wouldn't be a perfect place anymore. So God, long before the world was created, devised another plan to give us both the inner, uh, way to enter into His presence now and to find His blessings now in this life and to go to heaven for all of eternity. It's called grace. We see glimpses of it all throughout the Old Testament. For instance, Psalm 145.8 says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in mercy. But it's not until the New Testament that we see grace in all of its fullness through Jesus Christ. The Bible says God's a gracious God. What that means practically is God's in the business of blessing people who don't deserve it, which is good for all of us because none of us deserve to be blessed the way that we've been blessed. This decision of God to bless us, even though we don't deserve it, is called grace. And understanding grace is not only the key to entering the Christian life, it's also the key to living the Christian life. The more you understand God's amazing grace, the more you're going to love and appreciate God, the more peace and joy you're going to have in your everyday life. That's why we're beginning a new series today called Amazing Grace. It's a series that attempts to answer the question, what is grace? Now, there is no one-sentence answer to that question because grace is like a multifaceted diamond. That's why for the next eight weeks, we're going to take the subject of grace and we're going to look at it from one perspective and, uh, and another from different angles. Now, while no, no, no one sentence is adequate to define grace, there are a lot of one-sentence attempts to explain grace and they're helpful in pointing us in the right direction. Someone has said, grace is God's love in action. Another well-known definition of grace is God giving me what I need and not what I deserve. Another definition I like is, grace is the face God wears when He looks at my failures. Which reminds me, before we can understand grace, we have to understand the difference between grace and mercy. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve. Suppose you're traveling on a long business trip, you often make these trips and one night you, you're, you feel lonely and you've had too much to drink and you do something really foolish, you have a one night stand. And even worse, you find out that the person that you participate in that one night stand with has AIDS. But you didn't get AIDS even though you, were, you fell down and, and were having an extramarital affair. Well, that's God's mercy. God's mercy means we don't always get the punishment that we deserve. God corrects us, but He doesn't always give us the punishment, the things that we deserve. And that's good for all of us because we'd all be in trouble if everything that we've ever done 
wrong, we suffered punishment for all of those things, even though we rightly deserve them. That's God's mercy. God's mercy means we don't always get the punishment that we do deserve. And God, God's very merciful, or we'd all be in bad shape. Mercy is when we don't get the bad things we deserve. Grace is when God gives us good things that we don't deserve. None of us imperfect people deserve to go to a perfect place like heaven, but God chooses to allow us to go to heaven through the sacrifice of His Son because of His amazing grace. Now, I know that many of you think you know a lot about grace. Most of you certainly know we're saved by grace. Many people think they understand the concept of grace. But what I've discovered in almost 40 years as a pastor is even people who've been Christians for many years often don't really understand the depths of God's grace, and they certainly don't know the freeing power of that grace as they live their everyday lives. Most people, even most Christians, spend their entire lives feeling deep down inside that somehow they're saved by the things that they do. Most people never really enjoy the relationship with God because they're trying so hard to earn God's love by being perfect or at least good enough. But being pretty good is not good enough to get into heaven. And since we all fall short of perfection, if you live your life trying to earn God's love and His favor and His blessing, you're always going to feel like you're coming up short and that God's displeased with you. So that God becomes this unpleasable parent in the sky with a clipboard and a pen who's always busy making notes on your performance, especially when you're not doing too well. No one can have a close personal relationship with a critical, nagging, fault-finding judge who's always just waiting to find something wrong with your life and to condemn you. Understanding and living out grace means it's possible for you to have a deep, personal, meaningful, fulfilling relationship with God like a loving father who cares for you and is not looking for all the wrong things that you do. Understanding and living out God's amazing grace will bring real joy into your life. That's why we're going to spend the next eight weeks looking at grace because whether you're a new believer or you've been a believer for 50 or more years, we can all benefit from a fresh and deeper understanding of what grace means in our lives. Now, my goal in this series is not just that you'll understand more about grace, but also that you'll come to experience it in all of its fullness. So what is grace? <clears throat> there's so many dimensions to grace. Next week we're going to look at restoring grace, how God wipes out our guilt and helps you start over. Then we're going to look at sustaining grace, how God gives you the power to keep on keeping on even when you feel like giving up. We're going to look at healing grace, how God does miracles in our lives. We're going to talk about liberating, liberating grace, how to break free from the performance trap. We're going to look at assuring grace, how to defeat your doubts. Then we're going to look at offering grace, how do you extend God's grace to others. And finally, we're going to end the series by talking about growing in grace, how you become everything God created you to be, not by your willpower, but by His great power and by the Holy Spirit at work in your life. But today we're going to lay the foundation for this whole series by talking about God's saving grace. Now for some of you, this may be a review. For others of you, this may be entirely new. <clears throat> but for all of us, we all can benefit by being reminded of these foundational truths that undergird the Christian faith. Today we're going to look at five aspects of saving grace. How can you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die? Well, you can know that for sure because of God's grace extended to you through Jesus Christ. It's not what we do ultimately, it's what He's done for us on the cross. The five points of this sermon this morning are built around an acrostic for grace, which reminds me of a story I heard about a graduation speaker at Yale who built his commencement address around an acrostic for the word Yale. He said, Yale students are young, that was the why, A, adventurous, adventurous, L, loyal, and E, enthusiastic. It was a good idea, but he just beat every point to death. He went on and on until the address was over an hour long. The crowd was just worn out. <clears throat> when the speaker finally finished, he looked down at a graduate in the front row and he said, well, what did you think of my graduation speech? To which the student replied, well, I was just thinking that I'm glad I didn't go to a school with a name like Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I promise you my grace acrostic is not going to take that long. 
So we'll jump right in. The G in the grace acrostic stands for God's gift to me. Romans 13, 24 says, I mean 3, 24 says, All of us need to be made right with God by His grace, which is a free gift through Jesus Christ. All throughout the Bible, the emphasis is God's grace that results in our salvation through Jesus Christ is a free gift. Because of the American work ethic that still permeates so much of our society, most people can't believe <clears throat> that anything of value is free. So they hear these words, but they still think, you know, in some way or another, I, there are things I have to do to earn my salvation. Most people think, and you can talk to anyone who's been out door-to-door -door witnessing evangelism explosion or anything like that over the years... And the majority of people, if you can get them to be honest with you, feel like that when they get to the gate of heaven, they're going to be let in because they've done enough good things to outweigh the bad things that they've done. So based on the fact that they've done enough good things to outweigh the bad things, they think they're going to get to the gate to the heaven and God's going to say, well, just come on in. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, God says in the Bible that eternal life, our salvation, is so precious. It has such a great value and can only be purchased at such a high cost that none of us could ever do enough to earn it. So Jesus Christ paid the price for our salvation on the cross and He gives it to us as a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't learn it. You can't bargain for it. You can't buy it. You can only receive it from God as a gift. Now this is the fundamental difference between Christianity and every other world religion. Every other belief system, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, all the other religions of the world are built on you doing something to earn God's favor. Christianity is the only world religion that says you can't earn or deserve heaven. You can only receive it as a gift. Every other religion is based on works, and you can summarize them in one word, and that word would be do. Do this or do that to earn God's approval. And the only thing that, uh, that varies between religions is, what is it you're supposed to do? Rules, regulations, rituals, regular meditations, sacred pilgrimages, etc., etc. On the other hand, if you were going to summarize Christianity in one word, it would be the word done. Everything that is necessary for your salvation was done on the cross for you by Jesus Christ. He took the punishment for your sins. He paid the price for your salvation. It's all been done. If you ask me, what can I do to be saved? If I wanted to give you a biblical answer, a very literal answer, I would say you're too late. You're 2,000 years too late. What needed to be done for your salvation was done on the cross 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. You can respond to what has been done and receive God's gift of salvation, but you can't do anything to save yourself because it has already been done. That's why when Jesus was dying on the cross, at the very end he said, it is finished, to telestai. He didn't say he was finished because he wasn't. In three days he was resurrected by God from the grave. That's what we celebrate every Easter. So what did he mean when he said, it is finished? Well, what he meant was God's plan to provide salvation to every person who's willing to receive it is finished. To tell us, I paid in full. The debt's been paid. Everything that needed to be done has been done. You can't do anything that will add to what Jesus Christ has already done for you on the cross. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. Salvation is only possible as a free gift from God paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not getting to heaven based on what I do. You're not getting to heaven based on what you do. I'm getting to heaven based on what Jesus Christ has already done for me on the cross, and so are you. That's the greatest deal that anyone can ever offer you. No one can offer you a greater gift than eternal life in a wonderful place called heaven. That's why I want you to understand all that grace means so that you'll really accept it because God's grace is a priceless gift. The R in the grace acrostic stands for received by faith. 
God's gift of grace is received by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you've been saved by, through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. What that's saying is faith is a key that unlocks the door to heaven. Grace and salvation is a gift, but you have to receive it. And the way that you do that is by faith. By trusting God that what he says he will do, he will do. If I call you and say, I, I've been traveling and I got you a really great gift, could you come by and pick it up? Well, you have to decide first of all whether I'm telling you the truth. Secondly, you know, will the gift be worth the gas it takes for you to come to my house and get it? And then are you, are you just going to come? And if you don't come, the gift just sits there. Well, the message of the Bible is don't let God's great gift to you just sit there unreceived. Take hold of what Christ died to give you. But when you receive it, the Bible says, as valuable and as wonderful as it is, you can't brag about it because you didn't do anything to deserve it. Do you realize how miserable heaven would be if everyone was up there talking about what a great person they were and all the great things they did in order to get into heaven? Your salvation is a grace gift. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. So we can't brag about how we got it or the, how much we deserved it or the great things we did. All we can do is accept it and be grateful for it. That's why my favorite definition, you know, for sharing your faith is just one blind beggar showing another blind beggar where they can find the bread of life. Romans 4.16 says, People receive God's promise by having faith. This happens so the promise can be a free gift. What's Paul saying here? Salvation isn't based on my performance. It's based on God's promise. It's not, it's not based on my goodness. It's based on God's grace. I'm getting into heaven not based on my merit, but based on God's mercy. That's why God, God gets all the glory, because there's no way that we could save ourselves. Now, the Bible's full of stories that, in, uh, that illustrate this principle of grace. One of my favorites is in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel 9. It's the story of Mephibosheth. Do you remember the story of David and Saul? Most of you do. And you know that David, you know, he came into Saul's court evidently when he was fairly young. But along the way, you know, Saul was disobedient to God. And God finally said, that's it. I'm going to rip the kingdom away from Saul. There's going to be no dynasty from Saul's family. When Saul's gone, that's it. And Samuel anoints David to be the future king. But Saul, of course, learns of this and he becomes insanely jealous and he thinks, well, if I kill David, that will be the end of him being the king and then the dynasty will stay in my family. He was crazy. You know, Saul was crazy. He just went mad with this obsession of trying to kill David. So David spent many years running from Saul, trying to avoid being killed. But David never retaliated. And ironically, he had become over the years best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. Now these two friends made a secret pact or a secret covenant that if either of them ever died, they would take care of the other's family. Years later, both Saul and jo Jonathan were killed in battle at the same time and David became the king. Now, all of Saul's relatives are terrified because now that David is a king, they were afraid he'd try to kill them just as Saul had tried to kill him. So they went into hiding, and one of the relatives they were trying to hide was Jonathan's infant son, Mephibosheth. Now, unfortunately, the nurse that was carrying him was running with him to flee, and she stumbled and dropped him, and he became permanently crippled. The result was a young boy, crippled but very much alive, who could have claimed a right to the throne through his grandfather who tried to kill David. So by all human standards, David would be a fool to do anything to help Mephibosheth. But because of his promise to his friend Jonathan, and because David walked closely with God and had learned the importance of mercy and grace from God, David brought Mephibosheth to his palace, and he made him a part of his own family, and he took care of him for the rest of his life. Mephibosheth sat at the king's table every night. David paid all of his bills. He took care of all of his needs. He treated him like one of his own sons. That's grace, and that's what God does for each of us. God comes, and he finds us imperfect and broken and disabled by our flaws and our sins and our weaknesses. And he says, I want to bring you into my family and take care of you, not only for the rest of your life, 
here on earth, but for all of eternity. I want you to sit at my table in, in the kingdom of heaven, and I'm going to treat you like royalty, not because you in any way deserve it, but just because of my grace. The greatest parable, I think, in the New Testament of Jesus is the parable of the prodigal son. You all know that so well, the story of the wealthy man who had two sons. The younger one, very insulting to his father. You know, I'm not going to wait for you to die. I want my inheritance now. The father doesn't have to give it to him, but he does give it to him. All the young son wants to do, I want to get away from this farm. I want to get away from my father. I want to see the world. He goes off. And he party, party, parties. The way that we know is because when the older brother, you know, won't go into the party at the end, he says, this son of yours who wasted all your money on prostitutes. So it was wine, women, and song. He goes through all the money. And when he's gone through all the money, all the good time friends that were there when he was paying the bills for the partying, well, they disappear too. And now he has no one to help him. He's in the far country and he's having to feed hogs for a living. And of course, for a young Jewish man, the most humiliating thing in the world would be, would be to slop hogs because the Jews saw them as some of the most unclean of all animals. So here is this young man starving so poor that he's longing to eat what the pigs are eating, living, you know, in absolute misery. But the Bible tells us one day he came to his senses and he said, even the servants in my father's house live better than this. I'm going to go home. And all the way home, he practices his speech to his father. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Take me back as one of your hired men. But the Bible tells us while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. He must have been looking for him. He, see, he sees his frame coming. Instead of being angry, the father rushes out to meet his son and he throws his arms around him and the son tries to get into his take me back as one of your hired men speech, but the father doesn't want to hear it. He's, he's, he's calling for his servants to bring his son a beautiful robe and put over the rags he's wearing and bring the family signet ring that the boy had gambled away and kill the fatted calf and invite everyone to come and celebrate because this son of mine that was dead is alive, that was lost is found. And Jesus said that's how the God of the universe responds when one of his straying children comes home. We're supposed to be shocked by the parable. We're supposed to be sympathetic to the older brother who says, I'm not going into a party for someone. They don't deserve it. He didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve anything but disgrace and, you know, rejection. But that's not how God chooses to deal with us. The A in the grace acrostic stands for available to everyone, regardless of your background, your race, your nationality, your educational level, regardless of any bad things you might have done in the past, regardless of whether or not you've ever had any religious training or maybe you've had the wrong kind of religious training. God makes His grace, the Bible says, available to you if you will receive it. Romans 4.16 says the promise is not only for those people that live under the law, uh, who, that live under the law of Moses, it is for anyone who lives with faith like Abraham. The people who lived under the law of Moses, of course, were the Jews. They were given the ways of God before those ways were given to the rest of us. They were, that's why they were called God's chosen people. Why did God have a chosen people? Because He loved them more than He loved anyone else? No, they were chosen for a purpose. They were chosen to spread the message to the entire world, to everyone around them. They were to tell the world there's only one true God. These are the ways of God. They were to be missionaries to the rest of the world, but they didn't do it. And that should be a warning to us because now God has taken the task of taking the good news of His great love and forgiveness and giving it to the church, and that includes Jews and Gentiles, anyone who's willing to accept God's wonderful gift of salvation. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice it doesn't say really good people who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Or it doesn't say really rich people or really smart people. It says anybody who places their faith in the grace of God through Jesus Christ will be saved. The sad thing is that although many people know that God's grace is a free gift, they still try to work their way to heaven. They think that something they do in their lives is going to make them good enough to get into heaven. But heaven's perfect and we're not. And the only way that imperfect people like you and me are going to get into a perfect heaven is by receiving God's gift by faith available to whoever will receive it through Jesus Christ. And that's the next point. The C in the acrostic, the grace acrostic. It comes only through Christ. 
John 1.17, our scripture reading this morning. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Why through Jesus Christ? Why is Jesus Christ the only way to get to heaven? Do you know most evangelical Christians don't believe that? Almost half of evangelical Christians believe that there are many paths to God. You know, but the Bible doesn't say, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Why is Jesus the only way to heaven? Why won't just any religion do? Because Jesus Christ is the only one who ever paid the price. Jesus Christ paid the price for your admission to heaven. He paid for your sins by dying on the cross, and no one else ever has done that. No one else ever can do it because Jesus was unique. He was God in human flesh. He was the God man. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. It costs Jesus Christ his life. The law tells me when I've blown it. But grace tells me how to get back on track and be forgiven and get going in the right direction again. Romans 5.15 says, Many people have received God's gift of life by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. The Bible's favorite description for a person who's received God's grace is a little phrase, in Christ. That's used more than 120 times in the New Testament. But as I've told you before, if I ask you, are you in Christ? Most Christians aren't quite sure what I'm saying. Well, you know, if I ask you, are you in banking? You know immediately what I mean. Banking's the context of your life. You, if, are you in farming? Yeah. I'm, I, I'm in farming. Farming is the, the context of my life. But when we say, are you in Christ, is that the context for your life? I mean, we've talked about easy believerism before, you know. It's not just believing like you believe. Well, I believe in Einstein's theory of relativity. It has no effect on my life, but I believe it's true. Well, it's not just believing that Jesus Christ, you know, was born and then they lived a sinless life, dubs, died a substitutionary atoning death, was raised on the third day, sits at the right hand of God the Father, and is coming again someday. The devil knows all those things. It's not just believing facts. It's about being in Christ. Let me tell you one of my oldest. I remember this from when I first started preaching in Texas. They had cowboy revivals in the summer. They were so desperate they would even invite me. (laughs) And I would say... I would say, one of my very first illustrations, I would say, imagine this piece of paper is my life. And imagine that this Bible is Jesus Christ. Now, as I go through my life, you know, I get crushed by things that happen to me in life. Other people do things that hurt me. I do things. You know, I get tattered and I get torn. I have sins in my life and make terrible mistakes in my life, you know. And before long, I realize that this crumpled, torn, tattered mess is never going to get into a perfect place like heaven. But then one day I hear about Jesus Christ, and I decide that I'm going to receive Him, and I'm going to be in Christ. Now remember, the Bible represents Christ. So what do you see now? Do you see all the tatters and the tears and the mistakes? No. All you see is Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing that the Bible says is is that when we are in Jesus Christ, God chooses to look at us through the eyes of grace. And when He looks at our lives, He doesn't see all the sins and mistakes and weaknesses and disabilities, you know, that we have. He sees Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. All your sins are covered by Jesus Christ. No one likes to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, liberals started calling that a slaughterhouse religion. Well, listen, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you you ever watch those Chicago shows, Chicago Fire, Chicago Med, Chicago Police? Elaine loves those shows. We (laughs) We watch them every week. Oh, they're bloody, bloody, bloody. And when they're, whether they're the police or the firemen or the surgeons, when they're saving people's lives, they get covered with blood. And nobody says, oh, look at those slaughterhouse saviors. You know, Jesus shed his blood on the cross because he loves us. You know, that's the ultimate expression of God's, God's grace to us is that he came into this world and he died for us and for our sins all to be covered by... That's what the old-time preachers would say. They wouldn't put it in the book. They'd talk about being covered with the blood of Jesus Christ covers all your sins. The Bible tells us that when God looks at us, All he sees is the righteousness of Christ. He looks at us through the eyes of grace. That's why those who are in in Christ get into heaven. 
because their imperfections have been covered by His perfection. Galatians 2.21 says, Don't treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if we could be saved by keeping the law, that means by doing the right things, then there'd be no need for Christ to die. If you could be good enough to get into heaven, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come into this world and suffer and die a terrible death on a cross. But there was no other way. You're either going to get into heaven because you're in Christ or you're just not going to get in. One of the best acrostics for grace I know is God's riches at Christ's expense. Your salvation in this life and for all of eternity comes only through Jesus Christ. Finally, the E in the grace acrostic stands for extended throughout eternity. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How long is eternal? Well, that's forever and ever and ever. The results of God's grace go on forever and ever throughout the uncountable trillions and trillions and trillions of years of eternity. You talk about the gift that keeps on giving. When you're in Christ, the best is always still to come. And things just keep getting better and better. Those who are in Christ get to go to heaven and stay there forever. What's heaven going to be like? The Bible tells us at least four things about heaven. First, it's going to be a place of reunion where we're reunited with those we love who've also chosen to be in Christ. Second, it's going to be a place of reward. This is where, this is where how you live your life does make a difference because the Bible says for those who faithfully do what God asks us to do, that there will be rewards in heaven. Third, heaven's going to be a place where we are assigned jobs that perfectly fit us. In other words, we're not going to sit around and be bored just sitting on the heavens, you know, sitting on the clouds forever. God's going to get do you think, give you things to do that are exciting and that meaningful. And finally, heaven's going to be a place of release where we're released from all the suffering, all the sorrow, all the sadness, all the loneliness, all the depression, the sinfulness, the sickness, everything else that destroys our happiness now here on earth. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place, and you're going to want to be there. But it's a gift, a gift that you have to accept now. You know, it was shocking to me, the latest Barna survey, 33% of Christians believe in that reincarnation is a distinct possibility. A third of evangelical Christians believe that reincarnation, the Bible is clear, Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. I wish you did have, well, I, I wouldn't want three, more, three or four more lives on this earth, <laughs> much less three or four hundred the way, you know, the Hindus believe, you know. I wouldn't want all those lives here on earth, but it's not a possibility anyway. Only one life to live and soon it's past. Only what's done for Christ will last. You know, that, that you have to accept it now. That's the thing. People say, well, if there was a God, all these bad things wouldn't happen. Well, you see, God creates an environment where we have a choice, and our choices have consequences. Now, you only live on this earth 80, 90, 100 years, a very short time compared to the uncountable trillions and trillions of uh, years. But the, the Bible says the reason that you're here is because you have to make a choice. You either say, God, I want to be a part of your life, a part of your family, or I don't. And God doesn't overwhelm us because if you could see God and he was always writing your sins on the wall, you'd be scared to do anything but be, obey God. So God creates an environment where you're free, but your freedom has real consequences. If I jump off of this pulpit, grab Gordon by the neck and shake him <laughs> to death, you know, and he dies, I mean, that's a real consequence. And you say, well, why would God let that happen in church? Such a godly good man is Gordon. You know, why would God? Because God's given me a free will. And there are consequences, you know, to the things that I do. Now, God knew I was going to do that. He takes Gordon right to heaven. In other words, even the bad that I choose to do is mitigated. And even if I make terrible mistakes, I can turn, you know, and I can turn to Christ and be completely forgiven for those. So God, you know, people say God is hard and the world is... You know, the world is the way it is. Mostly, the, a lot of the evils in the world are because of the way we treat other people. It's man's inhumanity to man. So much of the starvation is not because we don't have enough food in the world. It's because we hoard it in some parts of the world and don't give it to people in other parts of the world that need that. Isaiah 30, 18 says, Though the Lord longs to be gracious to you. God longs to forgive your sins, to place your life in Christ, to guide you all through 
this life as a good shepherd, and then to take you to live with him forever in heaven. The Bible says God longs to extend his grace to you. The only question is whether or not you will receive it. And some people just keep putting that off and putting that off and putting that off. Because they have the misunderstanding that once they receive Christ that somehow they've got to be perfect. So I've got to quit smoking first or I've got to quit swearing first or I've got to quit drinking first. You know, all these things that people have told me over the years because they think they have to be good enough to get in heaven. No, God says, come to me just as you are with all your wrinkles and warts and sins and mistakes. And as you're in Christ and my spirit fills you, I change you from the inside out. If you wait to be good enough, you're never going to be good enough. And we never know whether we're going to draw another breath. Isaiah 30, 18. The Lord longs to be gracious unto you. If you've never received God's amazing gift of grace, you need to do that. You can do it today. You can do it here. You can do it tomorrow. Except we don't know whether we have tomorrow. You don't have to be in a church. Just between you and God, you say, I want to receive your gift of amazing grace. And then once you've received it, you need to grow in that grace, and we're going to talk about that, so that you're not feeling still deep down inside. Somehow, you know, on my days when I fall down, God loves me less, and then if I'm good, God loves me more. And like I said, the parent in the sky with the clipboard always writing down what you're doing, usually focusing on the things that you're doing wrong. God longs, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Won't you accept God's saving grace? We're going to talk about so many dimensions of grace, but none of them mean anything or available to you until you've accepted God's saving grace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each person who is here. I know many have been Christians for many years. But Father, I know that there are others. They may have been, you know, here. They may have been baptized. They may have know the Bible, Father, but they've never received your grace. They never really understood, Father, that it's a free gift. In all their life, they've somehow been trying to earn it, never been able to feel really close to you because they know that all of us fall so far short of the glory of God. Father, I thank you that you made a way for us to come to you as a loving Heavenly Father and that you long to be gracious to us. I pray for those who have accepted Christ's grace that they might grow in that grace, each one of us. And then, Father, I pray for those who may never have accepted that grace. Maybe this morning they want to say something like, Dear God, I realize I could never be good enough to earn a place in heaven. I realize that the only way I will ever get in is by your grace. So forgive my sins. Thank you for offering me what I need and not what I deserve. Thank you for Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for my salvation. Father, I want to accept that free gift today. I want you to guide my life. I want to be, learn what it means to be in Christ. Father, I pray for each person who is here today that we might know you more intimately, that we might truly understand what it means to be in Christ and the peace and the joy, Father, so that the storms that go on all around us, and there's so many storms that we are going on around us today, that there will be a quiet sense of calm and even joy and peace in the midst of it all because we know that we're in Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.